Good evening, OPN, all our chatters and our supporters, other channels that may be mirroring us. Thank you very much for being on with us tonight. We're honored and privileged to have Dr. Margaret Flowers on tonight to open up our series of, we're calling it, It's Our Economy Week. Um, and this is mostly because the uh, third show oh, is gonna gonna be involving the It's Our Economy uh, project from you and Kevin, so it seemed like an appropriate appropriate title for the week. So this is the first in three shows, and um, we're very fortunate to have Margaret here. So welcome to OPN and to the greater live stream viewing area. Great, thank you for having me on. Um, why don't you give us a short introduction to yourself and describe how you came to activism in general and healthcare reform activism in specific? Sure. Um, well, I'm a pediatrician. I have three children and I practiced for about 15 years. And during the time that I was practicing, I was in a couple of, in a community based practice. Um, I really felt like all the forces were aligned towards uh, driving me in the direction of providing poor quality care, not being able to spend time the care that they needed. It wasn't about what was best for them. It was about what they could afford and what the insurance companies would allow them to have. And, and um, I, uh, I, you know, I had other broader concerns. Of course, I was, you know, concerned about our nation going into war and having two sons. Uh, what that would mean for their future. Um, but uh, I started doing activism and advocacy around healthcare reform while I was in medical practice and um, came to a point where I had to really make a decision. You can't do both effectively and I wanted to concentrate on one and I saw my colleagues around me who were leaving practice and really the people that I saw leaving practice were the ones that I thought were really caring and, and good qualified doctors but they were getting frustrated and so I felt like it was more important to to work on uh, on advocacy than to practice. Um, so you made that decision to leave the practice and since then you've been mm -hmm. a full-time advocate is that correct? Right since 2007 I've been doing advocacy work full-time. Okay and um, your primary focus, as I understand it, is on single-payer health care? That's right. I um, started at the state level, um, looking, getting involved with health care reform at the state level, and I uh, quickly found that the state was trying the same things over and over again, giving tax credits to help people purchase private insurance or trying to expand Medicaid, and none of this was moving us forward. And um, that's when I learned about um, single payer and physicians for national health program, and I became involved with them, um, involved with the Maryland state chapter of physicians for national health program. And then in 2008, um, after Obama's election, and when it looked like healthcare was going to be, you know, in the spotlight nationally, I became involved in the national reform. I served as congressional fellow for physicians for national health program during 2009 and 2010. Um, but now, of course, I, I have, as you know, broad, broadened my um, advocacy beyond single payer. So that's still a primary focus for me. Okay, great. Um, so for those that aren't quite familiar with it, could you give us a layman's definition of single payer health care since we're going to be spending a lot of time on that tonight? Sure. Basically, single payer health care is what most other industrialized nations have. We have it here in the U.S. in the form of our, our um, Veterans Health Administration, which is a purely socialized health care system like the United Kingdom has. And then we have Medicare, which is a single-payer system for people over 65 years of age. And it basically, what we're talking about is similar to a national Medicare um, for everyone, where it's, it's a publicly funded health care system that's funded through our, our taxes and so we don't have to pay up front that starts from the moment you're born and you're covered until the time that you die everybody has the same access the same standard of care um, so it's lifelong comprehensive universal health care and it's basically creating a health care system that you can use when you need it 
so that we're not denying people care based on how much they can afford. You know, it's it's really it's a system that's put in place for us to use when we when we get sick or need a checkup. Um, and my next question was, it seems to be pretty obvious, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Why is okay. single payer uh, necessary and desirable relative to the system we have now, which I guess is characterized as an open market system? Right. Well, the, the system that we have now was never designed as a real health care system. It's kind of a hodgepodge that came about. Um, because we've clung to this private insurance model and because we tied private insurance to employment, which no other industrialized nation um, does. So it's not a real system. And what we find is that we now have about 30 or 40 years of experience with a, a privatized system, uh, private insurance. And as a result, we're spending more than per person per year on health care than any other industrialized nation. In some cases, we're spending twice as much per person as they do. And we're covering many fewer people. So we have about 50 million people that are uninsured. But we also have tens of millions of people that are underinsured. That number is growing. These are people that have insurance, but they can't afford actual care because of the copays or deductibles. Or they find that if they have a serious accident or illness, they face bankruptcy, and that doesn't happen in any other nation. So, um, and our health outcomes are pretty poor compared to other nations. We're ranked 37th in the world. So we're not getting a good value for all this money that we're spending, and a big part of that is because we have so many different insurance companies, it's created this massive bureaucracy that wastes a third of our health care dollar on marketing and administration, things that have nothing to do with actual care. So what happens under a single-payer system is that you you simplify the administrative piece remarkably like Medicare spends about three to five percent of their dollars on administration um, that means more money to pay for actual care it also means it's simpler for the patients you don't have to figure out what network you're in who you can see how much you pay how much they pay you know it, it makes it simpler for them it makes it simpler for doctors because we just focus on seeing our patients and deciding with them what the best care is for and then making those arrangements. We don't have to fight with an insurance company that's just there to make a profit and not to pay for actual care. Um, I don't know if I answered that. Guy's no, that, that was, that was a, a really, really good overview. I wanted to back up a little bit, and um, if, sure. if you can answer this, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you said that, the uh, current system, you're, uh, roughly a third of the health care dollar goes to marketing and advertising. Um, where marketing does, and administration. Marketing and administration. I guess advertising right. is part of marketing. Um, right. Where did you, Can you break down the other two-thirds? I mean, I'm just, just interested. Do we know how that's divided, um, you know, where the other 66% goes to? Like how much is actual care and, you, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, that's what the other two-thirds are. That's what actually pays for um, for care. Um, so, and then that 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 one-third, and that may be a conservative estimate because we know that um, that health insurance companies um, spend about 20 percent, or in some cases, 40 percent of premiums on marketing and administration. Um, we also know that hospitals and physician practices have to spend a significant part of their overhead on interfacing with all these different insurance companies. Right. Um, I Just as a side note, uh, in an ironic turn of events, you know, it, I work for a small nonprof, and our health insurance policies are due to renew here on September the 1st, and we got the, the notice that the, mm -hmm. um, the costs are going up 20% and wow. the coverage is going down. So, yeah. you, you know, so we're faced with that discussion every day. And I feel like, in my case, we're fortunate to even have insurance, but it's escalating. And we, we took a, my family took a big hit last year because of that. So I'm very interested in this. Um, would, yeah. Will the new, um, if we went to a single payer health care, it it does sound like it provides broader and more equal coverage to the right. population. Is it going to be an equivalent or better quality 
or do we not know until we get into it? Well, we feel that it's going to be better quality and actually be, begin to help us address our, our, uh, the health of our population. Um, because right now, the system that we have that's based on private insurance, these private insurance corporations have a responsibility, a legal responsibility, to maximize profits for their shareholders. And the only way they can do that is by charging a, you know, premiums as high as they can get away with and by trying not to pay for care and trying to keep the people out who actually are sick. And so that's completely counter to, you know, taking care of patients, keeping your population healthy. If we're fighting with insurance companies over things that our patients need, that doesn't really make sense. So when we take that whole piece out and now we have a national publicly financed healthcare system that's about health and everyone's in it. So from the lowest income to the highest income, everyone's in the same plan. We all have uh, an incentive to make that the best program that it can be. So we believe that this will actually lift the quality of care up and simplify it and bring it back to focusing on health again. Uh, I, that, that gives us another layer of optimism to, to hold on to. Um, well, that's what happens in other countries. It's not an experiment. This is, well, this is the normal in most other industrialized nations. Okay. Um, it's a good point to make, you know, supposedly the, the leader of the free world and we have substandard health care, rel relatively speaking. Um, right. Can you talk us through the chronology of the Reform Acts from 2009 forward and, you know, up through the recent Supreme Court decision on the health care package? Sure. It actually even started a little bit before 2009. Actually, in, in 2008, a man named Jack, Jacob Hacker with the New America Foundation wrote a proposal that kind of outlined the health care um, and system. And, and it was to be kind of a, a private-public combination where they thought that they would have this uh, public option that people could buy this public insurance where they could choose to purchase private insurance. And that was kind of taken up by the Democrats and adopted as, as what they wanted to push forward. Um, early in, sometime in 2008, it's believed that the Obama um, campaign team started making deals with the pharmaceutical and insurance companies. And uh, they kind of decided that the public option wasn't, you know, that was going to be their bargaining chip <laughs> with the insurance companies. So it wasn't really a solid piece of the proposal. But it's interesting because in December of 2008, after Obama was elected, um, the campaign encouraged people to have these house parties to talk about health care and share their feelings about health care. And when we looked at the materials that they prepared for those parties, they were really designed to drive people away from single payer and into supporting what the, the party had already decided was going to be the health reform. Um, and so that kind of raised our, uh, you know, red flags when we, when we saw that. And despite the fact that so many people had parties where they talked about single payer, in the final report, single payer got about one paragraph in a, you know, multi, you know, tens of pages long report. So they had pretty much decided they were trying to script the debate and, um, and, and give people this sense that they were part of it when they really weren't part of it. Um, so we started, we um, were part of a coalition called the Leadership Conference for Guaranteed Health Care Reform. And this was a coalition of uh, physicians, nurses, labor, faith groups, uh, community groups. We represented and we estimated about 20 million people across the nation. We started meeting with members of Congress and saying, as you move forward to put this legislation together, um, can you look at our proposals, our single-payer proposals, and compare those to what you're doing on the basis of how many people will be covered and how much it would cost? Because we knew that our system would be superior to what they were putting together. And, and of course, it, early on in 2009, there was a lot of agreement, and they said, of course, we'll do that. Well, of course, we'll include single-payer. But when it came to the first um, set of committee hearings in the Senate Finance Committee, Max Baucus's committee, um, they only invited industry industry people to the table. So the CEOs of insurance corporations, insurance lobbyists, pharmaceutical lobbyists, um, the CEOs of big businesses were invited. And we um, 
push to get them to invite a single payer supporter and um, they refused. We started having people call in and email the committee saying, you know, include a single payer supporter. They still refused, and that was when it was pretty clear that they didn't want to be presented with evidence of what actually works because that would interfere with their plan to pass this this bill that they had in mind. And so we actually protested. You know, Kevin and I were part of that eight people that stood up in the Senate Finance Committee. Um, and asked why they weren't allowing single payer uh, supporters there. And that, because it was on C-SPAN and so many people saw it, did put them on the spot. And, and I was then invited to testify before the next committee, which was the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee. And uh, Senator Kennedy was still alive at that point. He was the chair of that committee, so his staff contacted me. And single payer supporters did testify in the House as well, in the three committees there. But um, we saw that the the bill was pretty much being written by the industries. The woman that kind of wrote the white paper and outlined it is a woman named Liz Fowler. She was the senior vice president of public policy at WellPoint, one of the largest insurance companies in the country. She was hired by Max Paucus from that position to oversee health care reform in the Senate Finance Committee. And um, so in, in 2009, we saw the hearings in the Senate Finance Committee. And then um, the House started taking up their hearings. And in July, it was pretty interesting because the House um, Energy and Commerce Committee was really split. They were fighting. They couldn't really put anything together. They actually took a two-week break from talking about health care because they just were so divided. And um, the day before Medicare's birthday, or it may have been actually Medicare's birthday, the end of July, um, one of the members of that committee put forth an amendment and said, why don't we just get rid of Medicare? You know, let's, I'm, I'm putting this amendment to just dissolve Medicare. And nobody in that committee voted for it, neither the Republicans or the Democrats. None of them had the courage to vote to dissolve Medicare. So the next day he put forth an amendment, and it was to substitute a single-payer bill for what they were putting together. And that caused a lot, of, um, a lot of eruption in that committee. And so the Speaker of the House, Speaker Pelosi, said, if you withdraw that amendment, I'll introduce it to the full floor of the House. And so we were pretty excited about that because we thought for the first time in history single payer was going to be introduced on the floor of the House. And we were really pushing the members of Congress to, it's called whipping, where you meet with them and pushing them to support that amendment. Um, meantime, you know, we had August where the town halls were just crazy. If you remember that time, groups like Americans for Prosperity were hiring people and filling buses with people and telling them all kinds of misinformation and there was a lot of, it was it was um, kind of scary and threatening um, environment. Um, in the fall of 2009 we had the House vote on their versions of the bill. Um, in the 36 hours before that final vote the Speaker pulled the amendment, the single payer Amendment, so we never got to have that vote on the House floor. Um, they passed a version that had a public option in it. The public option was not something that we were supporting because it's not a policy that would work. Um, then in December, um, the Senate was focused on trying to pass their bill. Senator Sanders introduced an amendment that would substitute single payer for their bill, and that one actually, through pressure, we got that one to the floor of the Senate. But it was a doctor in uh, from Oklahoma, Senator Coburn, that actually used a maneuver to get that killed. Um, so the Senate really took it down to the wire and passed their version um, just before the winter break. What was interesting is that there was a lot of push from the public for a public option, and it was starting to look like more and more senators were supporting that. We saw then the White House and leadership pushing back against them not to include a public option because that was the deal they had cut with the insurance industry not to put that in there. So, um, you know, it was just, it was very interesting just seeing how um, very scripted it was, how very much it was driven by leadership and members of Congress were pressured no matter, you know, depending on the way they needed to pressure them to get them to support this bill, which is really a very corporate friendly bill. It's really uh, a bailout for the health industries in a major way. 
Um, well, from what I've been able to understand of it as I've read through a lot of the analysis and documentations is that mm -hmm. the, um, the requirement for everyone to have insurance pretty much the, the current bill pretty much okay. forces them to, to get it somehow on the open market, which gives the insurance companies pretty much carte blanche to do whatever they want as far as rating and care and all that. It's like they just, it's the, the foxes get into the hen house. And yeah. the requirement is that we have to have it. So you're kind of getting, getting it from both ends. Right. Right. Yeah, that was something that the insurance companies insisted on. In the meetings that I was in, um, they had these called stakeholder meetings. And the stakeholders, surprisingly, were not the health professionals or the patients. They were the, the corporations that profit off of our current situation. The insurance representatives always said very clearly up front, we must have this individual mandate. If we don't have it, we can't afford to cover more people. And um, so it's a, it's a huge giveaway to the insurance companies forcing people to purchase their product knowing that it's a flawed product. At the same time, we're giving about $500 billion of taxpayer money directly to the private insurance companies in the forms of subsidies. And as the bill was getting close to the end, we had said, look, you know, if you just took out the individual mandate, if you just took out using public dollars to give to private corporations, we would support this bill. If you would use those public dollars to build up our public systems, we would see that as a step forward. But of course, that wasn't in the plan because that's not where their campaign money comes from. It comes from these private companies. So it's a, it's, it's a really huge corporate welfare to do this, and it, it hurts us because what we're going to see is more and more people are going to be on an underinsured where they pay very high premiums for very skimpy coverage. Um, sorry, I had I just lost you for a second, but but I got you back. High okay. premiums for skimpy coverage, and it's so bad. so this battle goes on, and this right. the Supreme Court just reviewed the health care decision, and right. um, pretty much gave gave it a pass, right? You know, they let it stand as it was. Is that well, accurate? Actually, I, we would say that they probably made the worst decision that they could make. Um, I was with a, a group of physicians in our group, it's our economy.us and other single payer action, um, filed an amicus brief, a friend of the court um, brief with the Supreme Court. And we argued that the individual mandate to force people to purchase private insurance was not constitutional. Um, that, you know, once you did that, where did that stop? And they had kind of two criteria that they had to look at. One was, um, you know, is it constitutional to force people to purchase this? And is it necessary to force people to purchase this to achieve some goal? In this case, the goal of universal affordable health care. And we argued that um, not only was it not necessary to force people to purchase private insurance to get universal affordable coverage, but it wouldn't even work. Because if we look at other places that have tried it, or Massachusetts, which has the state version of our national bill, it hasn't, it hasn't worked. And even by their own admission, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, when they scored the Affordable Care Act, said that it would not be universal, that about 23 million people would be left out. And they've since raised that number up to, to 30 million. We expect that to go higher. So. Um, we argued in that brief that a Medicare for all system would actually achieve the goals and would be constitutional. So they, they upheld the, the law, but they upheld it um, as a tax penalty, um, saying that it's okay to penalize people with a tax for not purchasing this product. And then they also upheld, or what they ruled is that states, because about half of the people that were gaining are supposed to gain insurance under this bill, half of them are supposed to gain Medicaid. Um, but the states were fighting that, the, the federal government forcing them to expand their Medicaid roles. And the Supreme Court said that if they don't want to expand their Medicaid roles, they, they can't receive any kind of punishment for that, that if they don't have to do it. Um, as a result, um, we expect that may add around another 10 million people 
who won't gain coverage under this bill. So we may see 40 million people still uninsured when this bill is fully rolled out, and that's not far off from where we were to begin with. Um, and, so it's disappointing. And are are the if that number 30 to 40 million people are they subject to the to the penalty on top of all the other issues? It's, that's a good point. If they can't, if they're not eligible for Medicaid, they are forced to purchase private insurance or, um, or face a penalty. But you know, what we're really seeing here is is um, further privatization of our health care, and we're we're expecting to see that you know Medicaid and Medicare are going to be further privatized. Um, it's interesting that that shortly after the Supreme Court ruling, WellPoint bought. A company called Amerigroup, and Amerigroup is the largest administrator, private administrator of Medicaid in the country. So a lot of states have just been farming their Medicaid out into these private managed care organizations that suck off dollars for profit. Some of them, you know, they run very high administrative and kind of profit and marketing margins. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's so, the so a lot of different elements of the existing process or subtly being privatized be, because right. like they'll outsource and everything so so that seems to right. be the direction we're going so now I get to ask my my uh, question about the Ryan vice presidential candidate announcement and how is yeah. that going to impact the discussion on health care well, it's interesting because what it sounds like is that healthcare has really back at the forefront. Um, you know, it's been now over three years that we've been trying to get decent healthcare for people in this country, and it's still really up there at the top because we haven't solved the the crisis. So, Ryan, Paul Ryan, um, as your listeners may know, is the head of the House Budget Committee, and he has this plan called the Path to Prosperity. Um, you know, kind of a, we wonder who the prosperity is for, it's not for the people. Um, but basically, he would like to um, turn Medicare into a voucher system where, where people are given a certain amount of money and then expected to go out into the market and purchase private insurance. Um, and that the amount of money that that voucher would rise each year would be less than what our health care costs are rising. So that voucher would be worth less and less over time, putting more and more of the responsibility, financial responsibility on seniors who really can't afford it. We already know that seniors are struggling in this country and they, they already pay out of pocket too much for health care, so they don't have any room to, to pay more. But what's interesting is that, you know, Obama is also, um, in the Affordable Care Act, also making cuts um, to Medicare. So. Um, we look at the kind of the Republican plan as a very open, just wanting to gut and get rid of our social insurances. We look at the Democrat plan as just a way of kind of subtly and slowly privatizing and getting rid of our public insurances. So neither one of them are good, but the fact that he's there does mean that Medicare is back at the forefront again in the conversation, and it's a huge opportunity for us to push as people and say that we must preserve and protect protect traditional Medicare, the non-privatized Medicare. That's what works the best in our country, and that's what we should be protecting and expanding to every person. What's interesting, if I could just take a second, is that um, one of the reasons we say it was the worst decision that the Supreme Court could make is that just before the Supreme Court decision, a lot of groups were uh, anticipating that the court was going to decide that the individual mandate was not constitutional. And if they decided that that part of the law was not constitutional, that was really going to weaken the Affordable Care Act and possibly be the end of it. And so suddenly all of these groups were saying, we need Medicare for all. All these groups that were not saying it before were suddenly coming out publicly and saying, we need Medicare for all. Even the Congressional Progressive Caucus was ready on the day of the Supreme Court decision to have a press conference saying we need immediately to move to single-payer Medicare for all. Well, as soon as that Supreme Court decision came down, all those groups disappeared. They went back to cheering on the Affordable Care Act. And, and so it's really delaying the necessary reform that we have. We're not going to solve our health care crisis in this country until we move to a single-payer national Medicare for all. 
uh, how, so so it's a very big and complex thing and I was in a part of another discussion today about something completely unrelated but the same same thing applies is this discussion has been going on for years and years and years it is not mm -hmm. likely to change in three months it's not likely yeah. to change in three years um, what can we do as as a community as people to move that conversation along because you know we're none of us are getting any younger right right well I mean the the real obstacle that we face is the same obstacle that almost every other group that's working for social or economic or environmental justice or against the wars um, faces, and that's the corporate control of our political process and kind of the corporate media that we have that that propagandizes people and you know and gives kind of the corporate line on 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 things and and kind of fools people into acting against their own best interests. So. Um, that's what we really have to address is how do we shift the power away from that corporate control and I know we'll talk more about that on on Thursday so I don't want to get into that too much but that's what really caused me to broaden my advocacy is that what we need to do is start coming together in solidarity and and working strategically to shift shift the political power back towards the people so that we start having policies that represent um, the needs of the people and but there is a real opportunity right now with Medicare being out in the public to um, to protest, to speak out, to write letters, to post articles um, about Medicare and, and really have a loud cry saying that we demand um, that you preserve traditional Medicare and not only that, we'd like you to go beyond that and expand it to every person in this country. Um, because this is an opportunity. When it's in the spotlight, that's our opportunity to have that voice and to be heard. So um, I would encourage people to really, if you're interested in this issue, you can join Physicians for a National Health Program. It's pnhp.org. You don't have to be a physician uh, to join it. You can also go to the website there, and, and there's a lot of materials that you can read to, to learn more about this. You can invite speakers from PNHP to come and speak to your group. We have chapters in almost every state. And then there's a national grassroots group um, on the board of that as well is um, called Healthcare Now. It's healthcare-now.org. And there are Healthcare Now affiliated chapters in most of the states that people can get involved in and really start to build this grassroots groundswell to be out there publicly making this demand. Okay, that was that was a little bit of a tangential thing, but it was on my mind, and I think it's okay. it's really important because part of what we try to do here is is have calls to actions and 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 right. uh, you know actual information we can work with that we can accomplish something instead of just keep rehashing the problems. So that's why. Right. Um, I think n now would be a good time to speak to the healthcare as a human right campaign. I think. Sure. Yeah, this has been really interesting because um, this is kind of taking off and growing across the country. Um, what it's modeled based on what was done in Vermont, and in um, in you know 2008, 2009, the groups in Vermont that were advocating for health reform took a different approach and um, didn't really even pay attention to what was going on at, at the federal level. They um, started building a campaign in the state of Vermont on the on the principle of healthcare as a human right. And that's actually the principles that most other industrialized nations use. Um, those principles are universality, meaning everybody's in, nobody's out. Um, they're equity, meaning everybody gets what they need to have the same you know, standard of health. Um, transparency and accountability so that we know how our dollars are being used and making sure that priorities are on the right, you know, around people's health and not um, around profit. And then the fifth one is participation, that people have a role in determining what type of health system there is and, and what it covers and those kinds of things. And so they started holding truth hearings around the state and, it, and getting people to speak about their health care experiences and then educating them about these principles, about um, you know what a public health care system would look like 
and they passed a bill in the state um, legislature saying that the state had a responsibility to provide health care to everyone and that they would look at three different systems and then decide on which one was the best system, best universal system. Um, they continued that, that grassroots movement and that pressure and they passed a bill in 2010 um, which they hope will lay the foundation towards a universal system in that state. They still have a long way to go. Um, but more states, we're picking that up here in Maryland, um, Maine is doing it, Oregon, Washington State is looking at it and some other states of, of just getting out into the communities and um, bringing people together to start having these conversations about, you know, why is healthcare a human right? Not only um, do we believe it's a human right uh, because that's the right thing to do and because actually our government did sign a treaty, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 saying it was a human right, but also the countries that have adopted that model have the best health outcomes and they spend a lot less than we do. So it, it works as well as being the right thing. Um, so we're excited about that. We're going to be doing a very focused campaign to um, to move out into the communities much more in Maryland and uh, and start bringing people into this grassroots movement. So is, um, is a movement like that, you know, once again, Vermont, you know, little old Vermont shows us how progressive a state can be. Um, you know, they right. we, we studied them a little bit on the Citizen United case, and, you know, they did the same thing. They said, well, we're not going to tolerate this. But is the, right. the movement, the local movement, the state movement, to um, to campaign for this health care in the human right and lay the groundwork for universal health care at the state level, how does that interface uh, with the oppositions of the federal government? I mean, who in the in the hierarchy yeah. how does that play out so like if if a state is able to accomplish that tasks are they um, exempt from the federal regulations on whatever the health care plan at the time would be or does it is a mishmash there is a provision in the affordable care act that bernie sanders senator sanders um helped to get in there which said that in 2017 states would be able to apply for a waiver to opt out of the Affordable Care Act and do their own thing. To be honest, there are a lot of obstacles to getting a true single-payer system at the state level because there are some um, federal restrictions that, in addition to that, that we, states would have to get waivers from. So it does take federal action in order for a state to do a true single-payer system. We see the Healthcare is a Human Right campaign as important on a number of fronts. For one thing, it, it does um, create a larger grassroots uh, groundswell, educates more people about um, what single payer is and why it's important. That's going to be important for getting this at the national level. It also serves as kind of a balance to push states in the direction of, of, of having stronger health care reform than they otherwise would have. So if you have this outspoken single payer movement, then hopefully what they water down and compromise and basically come up with is going to be stronger than it otherwise would have been. But to be honest, our, um, you know, I, I know that some people, there's, this is a lot of discussion in the single payer community about this. Some people say we're, we're going to have to be like Canada and do it one state at a time. They did it one province at a time. We're not sure that that's really going to be a solution here in the United States because if we need federal legislation, to get single payer at the state level, we might as well push for federal legislation and get it for everybody right, at right. once. And a very simple campaign is just to say, let's drop two words from the Medicare Act, just take out, you know, over 65 and expand it to everyone immediately. That would give us a framework that we could then build on to create a really high quality health care system in this country. Okay. I, I, I like that. And once again, it's, it's a conceptually a simple fix if we could just get the politics squared away on it, right? It's conceptually simple, but it's also, you know, evidence-based simple. We know that if we if we went immediately to a Medicare for everyone and cut out the profit sector, that we would have enough dollars to take care of everyone. This has been studied, and we would have an actual system that we could tweak and build into a better system. The Affordable Care Act takes us in the wrong direction. We're never going to tweak that into a real health care system. Um, let's talk a little bit. Could you 
first define the divestment campaign and then talk a little bit about what that is. I did some reading on it, but I, I would stumble over it if I tried to define it. <laughs> sure. Well, um, you know, I went to college in the early 1980s, and that was around the time of the apartheid, um, in the movement against the apartheid in, in South Africa. And um, we were pushing for divestment campaigns then, pushing for um, – the U.S. to divest, U.S. corporations to divest from South Africa, so they didn't support that. Um, and it's a similar kind of concept around um, private insurance companies. Um, private insurance companies are, are not the only problem, but they're a huge problem in the healthcare system in the United States because they control our lawmakers and use our system to their advantage. And so, um, they're, what we're pushing for is for institutions and individuals to stop investing in private insurance companies. There's been a whole movement in the United States around um, socially responsible investing. And it was interesting when um, some of our doctors contacted one socially responsible investment corp company and said, do you have any insurance companies in your portfolio? They said, no, they didn't meet our criteria. So, um, so we're pushing for large institutions like uh, labor unions, like who have you know their pension plans, um, like um, faith-based institutions, uh, like a big target is TIAA CREF. They do the pension plans for all universities. They're invested in health insurance corporations. Is to push them to divest. And the hope is that if people start pulling their money out of the private insurance corporations, that it will start to weaken them and affect their ability to control our public policy. Um, so people can learn more about that through the healthcare-now.org website. And, um, and you know, this is something, something that every one of us can do, pull out of that kind of corporate. Um, and another actually important point is that the health insurance companies are kind of seeing the writing on the wall. They know their time is limited, so they're starting to invest their huge amounts of money into other areas of our health, you know, other health sectors. And so we need to stop that as well because we just, we've got to stop this privatization of our health care. I, I agree too. And the, the privatization, um, last last week uh, we, we did a movie series and we watched, I think it was in, uh, in, in Greece, no, I, I forget which country off the top of my head, but the, the whole government, everything was moving towards privatization bit by bit by mm -hmm. bit. And to watch that mm -hmm. movie, the parallels of where we are were startling. And, and we're, we're mm -hmm. at least to the, the vision of the average person watching, we're a little bit behind that curve. But you have to think under, under the surface, it's happening at a much more rapid rate. And the privatization for profit is just a huge deal, and uh, I think it's morally and ethically wrong for healthcare to be a profit-making industry. But that's just yeah, my well, soapbox. <laughs> I mean, it, we have you know our private industrial, I mean our private prison, com, you know, industrial complex, which um, you know we have the most prisoners based on our population um, in the world, the largest proportion of the world's prisoners. And these private corporations, once you make a profit off of prisoners, everybody is potentially a prisoner, right? Because the more people that can be in prison, the more money you make. We're seeing it with education, with the privatization of our schools through these charter schools. Um, we're seeing it through the uh, post office where they're trying to uh, downsize and really cut the post office and hurt its ability to be viable so that private corporations can take over that function. It's, it's something that we have to stop this neoliberal agenda. It's really important for us to recognize and, and work against. Um, why don't we, it, it, this is maybe a good point to move towards the issues of wealth inequality on health, which should be inherently obvious, but um, let's tell how single payer can help resolve some of those issues. So we currently have wealth inequality yeah. and health issues and how single payer will address that. Right. Well, we're one of the um, top four countries in the world in terms of having the greatest wealth inequality. Um, and there's a, a wonderful book, if people are interested, it's called The Spirit Level. 
and um, it's um, I'm bringing it. One of the authors, his last name was Wilkerson, I believe. And basically, these are public health people that looked at um, various countries and and what their kind of indicators of social well-being were, and and graphed that based on the degree of wealth and equality. And the United States was an outlier on every one of those measures. So, in terms of uh, poor education, um, high teen pregnancy rates, violence rates, suicide rates. Um, even issues like trust, um, we, we did very poorly in um, compared to the other nations. So wealth inequality is a huge driver of why we have an unhealthy nation and why we have poor health outcomes. And even if we pass single payer and give people access to health care, that will only have about a 10% impact on our overall health. We need to address these other social causes. Of, of health. So where does single payer affect that? When you have um, a national health care system where now the the government is responsible for paying for health care, they have an interest in keeping the health the population healthy. And so it starts to affect public policy and we see this in other countries. So in um, in Europe they passed a law saying that no consumer products could have chemicals in them unless those chemicals had been proven to be safe beforehand. We have the complete opposite in this country. You can put anything in a consumer product and it's only down the road that you may have to prove that it was, you know, not healthy. Part of the reason they passed that law is that they saw what the health effects and how much money they would save um, by having a healthier population that wasn't being poisoned by these chemicals. So that's one example of how it, it shapes public policy. We also see in, I think it was Finland, had a high rate of heart disease. And so their answer to that was to put in more walking trails, make healthier food available to people, and do a public education campaign about exercise and healthy eating. And it works. They brought down their heart um, disease rates. So here in the U.S., with obesity, a large part of our obesity problem is that we subsidize corn, you know, corn. We have corn syrup in nearly everything. So it would be in our nation's best interest from a health standpoint and a financial standpoint to stop subsidizing corn and putting corn syrup in everything. So that's how things would change under a single payer. Um, I want to touch, touch a little bit more like you mentioned Finland. And what are some other countries that are good models for single payer health care and also progress just progressive health care policies? I think uh, well France is the number one in the world and um, that's certainly an excellent model because they've had their system for a long time now so it's a very uh, comprehensive system they employ they they use um, kind of integrated health so they um, use non-traditional uh, types of health treatment in their system, they cover that where they're proven to improve the health of the population. And um, and so uh, France has a national system that everybody pays into. It's completely universal. So even if a person comes to that country and they don't have citizenship, they're included in that system because they recognize that they actually save money if everyone's covered because people can come in with infectious diseases and if they don't have treatment they can spread those infectious diseases and so by giving everyone access to care you can control the infectious diseases and keep the population healthier and save money so I think France is an, is an excellent system um, it's very simple I, I have a friend who practices there outside of Paris as a surgeon and he has very minimal office staff. Everybody has a, like a credit card type of card with a microchip in it that has some of their uh, medical information in it so that wherever they go for care, the, the health pro professional can give ac get access to their basic medical information. Um, so that improves the quality because um, you know the providers know what their problems are, their allergies and things like that. Um, when patients come into his office, they don't have to do a lot of paperwork. They just he swipes the card, puts in why they're there. That's it. Goes off to the system. Five days later, the system pays him, and he can just focus on his patients. And when, if one of his patients needs something that's not traditional care, he 
all what he has to do is then go to other physicians of his specialty and and talk to them about what he's proposed as care and if they say that that sounds reasonable that makes sense then it's accepted by the system and it's covered um, it's just a really common sense rational system that that is designed to, to keep people healthy um, Taiwan is the newest system to move to a single payer and they're interesting because that system was actually um, in large part designed by people from the United States um, from Harvard and from um, Yale and um, they kind of looked around the world at what was working the best they looked at what the people in their country wanted in their health system and they designed a single-payer system in the mid-90s um, they went to that system overnight they had about 50 percent of their population uninsured their health care costs were rising about 18 percent a year or maybe it was I think it was 14 or so percent a year they went to a completely universal system overnight everybody was suddenly in the system if you presented for care you were going to get it um, the first year, I think their health care costs rose about 18%, but then after that, they slowed the rate of rise to about 3 to 4%. They covered most of the population, they slowed the rise in their health care costs, their patient satisfaction went up remarkably. Um, so it just shows that it, it can be done. Mm -hmm. And um, and they based kind of their system on our Medicare. Right. Um, the the Taiwan story is interesting to me because in in through all this discussion, I've had this picture in my mind that there the in our country there would be a migration if single payer health care does go into effect. There would be a migration over time. But you essentially said Taiwan did it arbitrarily and overnight. Once they they made the decision, yeah. the next time you yeah. presented with care, it was a done deal. Right. Which is they had astonishing. an 18 month planning period. Right. They, did it, they did have a planning period, but then they went overnight. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That makes me optimistic, too. Um, well, it was done that way in, in Canada, and it was the way that we did it when we started Medicare. I mean, in 1965, when they passed Medicare, that was in a time when we didn't even have computers. They, they went to Medicare overnight. If you were over 65, you could enroll in Medicare. So it, it, we have historical precedent that it can be done if we had exactly. the if we had the political will to do it. Um, That's what we have to create. Which you know, here comes the obstructions uh, and challenges question. What what are our primary obstructions and challenges to getting this to happen? Obviously, one is big pharma, big medical corporations. Right, right, and it's and it's. In addition to the health insurance companies, you mentioned pharma is a big one. Also, these hospital corporations that are buying up hospitals, making them for profit, um, that's a huge problem as well. So they all, you know, they have a direct line to our lawmakers. They finance their campaigns. They have lobbyists that they pay to, to write their policy. That's, that's an obstacle. Um, but I think the biggest obstacle in this country is um, – is really us as people um, because you know for decades in this in this country we've been told at the state level mostly and recently at the national level that you know this is all the reform you can get you know we can't give you what you want the majority of people in this country support single-payer the polls are pretty solid for 20 years now that about two-thirds of the people in the United States support a Medicare for all. If you look at the Democratic Party, 80% of Democrats support Medicare for all. So we've got super majorities of people, the majority of physicians support Medicare for all. We want it. We're pretty clear on that. But when we're told we can't have it, that it's not politically feasible, we just go, oh, okay, then I, what can we have? <laughs> you know? And we accept that. And so that's what we're seeing right now around the Affordable Care Act, is that people are fighting to keep the Affordable Care Act because that's all they can get. And they're saying, but we're, you know, well, a few more people are covered. You know, my, my child can be covered. That's not insignificant. But tens of millions of people are still going to be completely left out. Tens of millions of more people are going to have skimpy, expensive coverage and face bankruptcy and lose their homes just because they got sick. I just found it was a... Um, sent a story yesterday 
of a man in, I think he was in Colorado, who worked for Wells Fargo and his daughter, young daughter got cancer and she needed some expensive surgery. And so uh, Wells Fargo called him in, you know, his boss called him in, asked him some questions about this. United Healthcare contacted him asking some questions about this. Three days before her surgery, they fired him. And they, he should have gotten COBRA that you're supposed to, if you lose your job, have another six months of coverage. They told him it was going to be 90 days before they could give him his COBRA paperwork. So his daughter, in the hospital, because he lost his job, canceled the surgery. And his daughter died. Why are we accepting that? The Affordable Care Act wouldn't have changed that. His company could still have fired him. He still could have lost his employer-based insurance. So these things are not going to change unless we go to an improved Medicare for All and unless we stop accepting what we're given and start demanding more. We're not going to get it. I guess there's a Frederick Douglass two quotes that I like from him. One is that you know, find out what people will tolerate and then you know how much you can oppress them. And the other is that power concedes nothing without a demand. So we've got to make that demand. Um, that is such a tragic story and I have the feeling that's not isolated instances. That that not probably happens similarly and frequently. People contact me with stories and it's horrendous what's happening. When I traveled with the Mattis Hell Doctors, um, they did a, a cross-country tour in 2009 and, um, and people were telling stories everywhere they went, similar kinds of stories. It's, um, this is the American story. This is what's happening right now and we're allowing it to happen by being silent, by accepting it. Um, and I, I think we'll probably get into the meat of this sort of issue in, in question on Wednesday night, but I want to speak to it a little bit right now. Um, what, if, if we have all these people and there's such support for such a thing, what is the hesitation on the part of the population to speak up and force the issue? Is it, is it fear? Fear is, is definitely there. Um, I guess maybe some people fear change, but I think the greater thing is is um, is what's going on with our our political system and how um, fear has been used to control people. Um, when the Affordable Care Act was coming down to the the final stages in Congress, um, members of Congress that I spoke to, you know, who were fairly progressive, understood that it was not an ideal bill it was not a good bill it was not addressing our fundamental problems it was not a solution but they said this is about the president it's about his career and I have to hold my nose and vote for it and that to me was infuriating because I said so you're gonna hold your nose and vote for a bill that allows people to continue to die and go bankrupt or suffer in this country because we don't have a health system and that's basically what it came down to. Um, it was a political decision and not a policy decision. And the Democratic Party, I have to say, they used front groups to prevent single payer. They knew that the majority of people wanted single payer, so how do you prevent the single payer supporters from stopping you from passing a corporate bill? Well, you give tens of millions of dollars to a group and you name it a name that's similar to a real single payer group, Healthcare Now. So they created Healthcare for America Now and used groups like Move On and uh, unions and others to create this grassroots swell around the public option, something that was not even going to be in the final bill no matter what. But they convinced people that they couldn't get single payer. We're going to push for the public option. It's our compromise. It's how we're going to get, you know, it's our back door to single payer. And people fell for that. And, and so we, I guess, at the end of the reform, um, I wrote an article in Tacoon Magazine and um, outlined kind of my three lessons from the reform process. And um, the the acronym for that is the letter is ICU. So you can think about that we're in a healthcare crisis and we need the ICU. And the I stands for independent. We have to see this as independent of political party. We're here to get healthcare for everyone. It doesn't matter who's in office. That's who we have to push on. 
focus on the issues. That's how Dr. King was. He never endorsed a political party. He said he had to be the conscience of both. He stuck to the issue. Um, the other is C, it stands for clarity. We have to understand what it is that works and what doesn't. The public option was not a backdoor to single payer. It was not even uh, a workable or evidence-based solution. So people have to understand what a real solution is so they don't get fooled by the misinformation. And then the U stands for uncompromising. We've just got to stop compromising on fundamentals because um, Gandhi said when you compromise on fundamentals, it's all give and no take. Um, so we see that the, the very smallest increments of change that we can make in this country are to create a system that everybody's in, a universal system, and to have the dollars to pay for that through a public financing mechanism, a single payer public uh, financing, because that's the only way that we can capture more of our dollars to use for actual health. Um, then from there, we can do a lot of, there's a lot more to do, but we cannot compromise. You know, any less than those two. Right. I I I love the acronym of the ICU. I mean, this this whole little this last five minutes has really got me rattled. The story about the young girl, and then the then the voting, and then the ICU, and it's it's something. I mean, you know, it's very hard. Um, I struggle with this all the time. That that we are so easily distracted. We are so easily sold. Uh, uh, a, a mm -hmm. lot of goods and we we do not challenge and we do not question effectively and that's how we got to where we are not only on this issue but the other right. thousand issues it's the same story the unwillingness to question and to think and to choose and to act um, right. so so this kind of thing gets me gets me wound up um, you you spoke in our notes early on about coming austerity measures and cuts to social insurances. Now this was before the the Ryan uh, announcement, which you know pretty much clarified that. But could you speak to what you, you you see coming down the pike as far as austerity measures and cuts? Yeah, and it's it's not just me. And you know, a lot of economists are predicting that following the November election, no matter whether it's a Democrat or a Republican that's elected, um, we're going to be seeing uh, austerity measures. They've really been laying the groundwork for a number of years. Um, there's an organization, a foundation called the Pete Peterson Foundation, and that foundation has is really focused on uh, cutting or ending what they call entitlement programs. Um, now that word entitlement is, you know, we have to stop using that word because that's their word that undermines them. What they are is their social insurances, their social infrastructure, they're what every other industrialized nation has and what you have to have. If you want to live in a capitalist society, it cannot be successful or live if you don't have a strong social infrastructure because capitalism in itself is a very unequal uh, system. So um, the United States, compared to other nations, we spend the smallest proportion of our GDP on our social infrastructure. Things like unemployment benefits, um, education, health care, pensions, those kinds of things. So um, the Pete Peterson Foundation would like to get rid of those. And um, in 2010, right after the health care bill was passed, Obama appointed 18 members to a commission called the National Commission for Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. And this commission was actually supported by the Pete Peterson Foundation. They paid for staff to help this, uh, this commission. And um, Obama appointed 14 fiscal hawks to this commission. Paul Ryan was one of them. And um, basically that commission was given the responsibility of developing a budget plan that would go to the floor of Congress, no amendments, no discussion, it was just going to go to the floor for an up or down vote. And um, I testified before that commission, as Kevin did as well, in um, June of 20, 2010. Um, I testified on the basis of uh, single payer of, on Medicare and how that's actually tied to our uh, fiscal problems and would be a solution to our fiscal problems. Um, and I, we have to remember, too, that this whole deficit thing is, is a manufactured um, issue. We don't have a deficit crisis in this country. We have a revenue crisis. If we actually taxed 
people, the, the rich, at rates that they used to be taxed at in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we would have no deficit at all. So they're calling it a deficit thing, but it's not. Anyway, so this commission was supposed to pass, was supposed to come up with these recommendations by December 1st. And they just couldn't get it together by December 1st, so they put them out by December 3rd, which meant they didn't have to go to the floor of Congress, but they still developed these recommendations. And that really laid the groundwork for Paul Ryan's kind of path to prosperity. Um, the next thing we saw when that failed was um, the creation of what was called the Super Committee. And these were 12 members of Congress, six were Democrats, six were Republicans, six from the House and six from the Senate. And they were also supposed to come up with uh, budget recommendations. And what was interesting was that as they were having their hearings and things, you started to hear Obama saying that he would be okay with making cuts to Social Security and Medicare, the first Democratic president ever to say that he would accept this. So this tells us where things are going. And um, we think that it was partly the Occupy movement that prevented the super committee from making those cuts. Um, there was, we led a big campaign in Washington. We were occupying Freedom Plaza. We had protests in the hearing room, outside the hearing room, outside the Senate building. We had our own super committee me meeting. We came up with our own proposal that would um, was much better than the one that Congress was putting together. People walked all the way from New York, from Philadelphia, from Baltimore to Washington to protest the super committee, and there was a lot of focus on them. And um, they kind of went out very quietly with no recommendations, but they were going to, to cut our Medicare and our Social Security. And so what's anticipated now is that since they didn't get away with it on these last couple of tries, that after the election, um, that's when it when it's going to happen. The prediction is that um, the Social Security age will be raised to 69. That the benefits will be cut for people that make forty thousand dollars or more a year. You're making too much, you know, you know, and um, and that Medicare itself also the the age will be raised and um, there will be cuts to that um, as well. So this is where our fight has got to be. This is what's happening around the world. We see governments manufacturing deficit crises and using that to justify austerity measures. Um, and so we're in a fight now just to save our basic social infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And and we see it, you know, across the board with our what's happening to our teachers, what's happening to our workers in general and unions. So we've got to unite around that. Right. So, I mean, it clearly, um, as you as you lay out the chronology, the groundwork has has been laid and is laid, so that the election there generally will have no effect that the austerity and the cuts are coming. Right. We it's just right. in what method they're presented is uh, right. basically. Um, yeah. So, my. My questions here is like, was what is being done to organize for health care reform? And, and I, I think you've spoken to that. And mm -hmm. we touched on what it will take to win single-payer health care and what can we do as impacted citizens, which, of course, is organize and rise up and speak out in the ICU. Um, right. So I want to close with my last question here, which is sort of, off topic of the single payer health care, but it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. <laughs> Roar. <laughs> um, mostly because of the elections. And I was wondering what, how you feel about the value or the, in the necessity of the electoral process as we're rolling into the election season. And let me frame the, the context for that question is, um, okay, we pretty much, we're in a two-party system. We have the lesser of two evils. So it doesn't matter who we vote for, the austerity, the cuts are coming. It's it's all the same. So a, a lot of people, you hear the rumble, they're, they're just going to check out. They're not going to vote. They're going to vote for a third-party candidate. And, yeah. and tactically, where is the value and necessity of voting, or is there one? 
Yeah, I mean, and this is something we definitely want to get into more on, on Thursday night, but um, we have to see this as a long-term effort. We're not going to change things, this election um, cycle. Um, you know, some people have said that President Obama is the more effective evil because he's able to get away with more than, than a Republican ever would have because the progressives would have been up in arms if it was a President McCain that was killing people in other countries with drones or, you know, detaining people indefinitely or waging a war on whistleblowers or these kinds of things. So um, so we have to recognize that, that they're, they're both equally or more equal or evil. But um, voting is important. Um, I would not encourage anyone to vote for a corporate candidate because we're going to get more wars, more militaries, and more corporatism if you do. Um, but if you vote for what you really want, the candidate that represents you, and there are other presidential candidates out there, they're not getting a lot of attention. Um, if you vote for them, what you're making is a statement. You're saying, I took the time to go for the po to the polls and vote, but I'm not accepting this corporate duopoly that we have in this country anymore. And parties that, you know, this is how we've gotten social change historically in this country. If you look at the abolition party, they didn't win elections, but they they challenged both pro-slavery parties. And eventually, it was the Republican Party that kind of became, adopted the platform of the abolition party. You know, if you saw in the um, early 1900s, you know, when you had Socialist Party candidates, they didn't ever win, but they pushed on, on, on the major parties and affected social change. So... You don't have to win to make a change, but but you are making a statement if you vote. So I, I encourage people to vote for what they really want. We've got to get into the habit of doing that as we do all of the other things that will shift the power in this country. Um, I, I like that statement. You, you know, you don't have to win, but, you know, the, the implication of that is we do have to push any way possible. Exactly. Yeah. And, we, you know, someone said, well, third parties are spoilers. And I said, well, like, if you're spoiling the corporate agenda of these two parties, what could be better? We want to spoil their agenda. We want to spoil them. We should embrace that. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Well, thank you for speaking to that. I know it's, you know, sometimes asking the, the question is, the voting question is kind of touchy, but... Um, I, I've gone full circle on that, and I think it's important to have that conversation. Now, I I, I look at it like uh, the system is not going to change in three months. It's just not. So we have to leverage it as much as possible any way we can um, while we're trying to come up with a different system. So <laughs> thank you for that. That was the source of that question. So I'm going to look over here, and we have a um, couple – couple of questions from the chat stream and if anybody has any more let's let's get them up now um, uh, there was a question and you spoke to the the Vermont uh, single-payer uh, program do you think there's a good chance that will progress and become established uh, are they working positively towards that they're definitely working towards it. Whether it will actually ever become a true single-payer system is, is in question, and, and whether it will itself start to get watered down is also a big challenge. Um, there is a grassroots organization called Vermont Workers Center, and they're doing really excellent on-the-ground work to keep this grassroots movement going. They have a, um, a policy group that, you know, when the legislature is in session, they're in there every day keeping an eye on what's going on and educating lawmakers. Um, so they're going to keep doing that, but um, uh, I think what I, there's a couple of red flags that are going up. I mean, we know that um, insurance corporations and other corporations are getting in there and doing marketing campaigns against the bill, finding business members who speak out against it, you know, and that's not a good thing. Also, the union, um, SEIU, is starting to try to get into that state. There's an excellent article by Steve Early from Communication Workers Association. He's, he does a good job of keeping an eye on SEIU. SEIU, I think, is one of the least democratic or and most anti-democratic unions 
um, in this country. They've been really at the heart of keeping us from getting single payer. So them getting their money and fingers into Vermont, I think, may give the governor some cover to weaken that legislation. So it's really still a battle. Um, I hope that people in Vermont will stay strong and keep fighting to make that bill the best it is, that program. But it, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. Um, the second the second question is, um, if this, and peaceful, if you could speak to what this is, um, if this becomes financially untenable, won't the government have to take it over? Um, isn't the small plan to eventually move for economic viability to socialized medicine? Um, did that make sense, or do I need to get some clarification? Yeah, Peace maybe a little... Peaceful, can you type into chat what the the question was not clear? And I'll jump on to the next one while I'm waiting for you to reply. Um, there is a chatter that is asking, is it, are you aware and is it true that Paul Ryan's r wife was a former lobbyist for Cigna and Blue Cross Blue Shield? Oh, I don't know the answer to that okay. one. Okay. Yeah, we'd like to deal in facts, and I didn't have time to look that up myself. So, yeah. um, so I think we're having a chatter speak to their significant other to clarify the question, <laughs> if you don't mind. Do you have any closing thoughts while we're waiting for that? Um, I guess. I mean, it, the other thing that I wanted to mention about how about how we're going to get to single payer is that. We do have to see single payer as part of a broader struggle for social and economic justice. Um, it's 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 part of the of the struggle for social, economic, and environmental justice. And so, if we can reunite all of those movements and work together strategically, we are able. To, we will be able to achieve this. I also encourage people um, to read another book. It's by a psychologist Bruce Levine. Dr. Bruce Levine, and it's called Get Up, Stand Up. And he writes, it's, it's the book's not that old, uh, just a few years ago, and, and he writes about why is it that in the United States we haven't gotten up and demanded these changes, that in other countries they do get out in the streets when, when you know, their government is afraid of them. And a big part of it is we have to start to have um, more individual self-confidence. You know, we have to believe in ourselves and our ability to affect change. And we have to also have a collective self-confidence that together we have the wisdom. You know, if you, if you look at the positions of, of people in the United States on, on important issues and look at the polling data, the people are right. The super majorities of people are right on all of these issues, and Congress is going in the complete opposite direction. So we have to believe in ourselves that we actually can see what the crises are and that we know what the, what the solutions are, and then have the confidence to demand those. So I encourage that as Get Up, Stand Up by Bruce Levine. Okay, and we have that link in, and I have a clarification on the question. Um, Okay. Under the ACA, if the insurance companies cannot actually manage all the coverage from all the people that are, are buying into it, won't the government have to take it over eventually anyway? Well, um, that's a good question. Basically, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act is going to fall apart at some point. It's not addressing the fundamental problems that we have. It's leaving too many people out, and it won't be able to control our health care costs. They're rising unsustainably as it is. So it's, it's going to fall apart. When that happens, that creates a vacuum. What's going to fill that vacuum? What the right wing is trying to push is a completely free market. Let's get rid of public programs. Everybody buys insurance. It gets sold across state lines, which would create kind of a Delaware situation where everybody goes to the state that has the worst regulations, and that's where they base their plans out of. Oh, yeah. um, so that that idea is out there. We've got to be out there really strong with the idea of, no, we want Medicare for all. And that's what we started to see before the Supreme Court decision. We saw a little more courage from some members of Congress and from the progressive groups 
being up front and saying that that's what we need to do. So it's it's um we've got to be organized, educated, and ready to to fill right in when that vacuum occurs. Um, I don't think we can take for granted that we'll just go there. No, no, it won't. And so my final question is is one that's a a, a little bit personal because I've read a, a lot about you and researching this, and I have mad mad respect for you. How is it that you are able to get up every day and fight the good fight against this this huge issue with so many, you know, obstructions and do so with such grace and dignity and enthusiasm? Thank you. I guess um, part of it maybe is just you know, who I am as a person, but part of it is just that, you know, we have to do this. Um, to me, when it came to health care, as a physician, knowing that we live in a country that spends the most on health care, that we have everything that we need to have a top health care system, but the only thing in the way is political will or our political system, that's not acceptable. We can't be silent as people in the face of that and just say, well, okay, we're going to cave in and just let that happen. Things are going in, in, you know, in, in the wrong direction in so many ways that we've just got to try to turn this around. I mean, I, I guess I couldn't live with myself if I just sat down and was silent. You know, I, I have to do this work. And it's, it's um, more and more people are waking up more and more people are getting involved. It's empowering. When we were down on Occupying Freedom Plaza and people came there that had never really been involved in activism before and they marched and they chanted and their voices were heard and they felt their power, that was a life-changing experience once you, once you start to speak out and tell the truth. I, I encourage everyone to do it. And you meet amazing people like you <laughs> that are involved in the struggle as well. So it's very rewarding. Well. Thank you for that, and thank you so much for your your work and the example you set, and for spending your evening with us. I know you're a busy woman and have a lot on your plate, and we're very grateful for you sharing your evening with us, and uh, we look forward to having you back on Thursday night, and uh, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed speaking with you, and um, I look forward to talking to you in a couple nights. Excellent. Thanks.